What I want to talk about today is cardiac drugs. And one of the first things I want to do is give you some context of who I'm teaching so that you don't misrepresent this information and try to apply it medically. This is not medically based information. I mean, it certainly is going to give you some idea of cardiac drugs, but who I am teaching are pre-nursing students, pre-health information technology students, pre-rad uh, tech, pre-respiratory therapy, things like that. And so this is not intended to be med school type knowledge, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I teach at community college. I teach, teach at Kirkwood Community College in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And what I'm trying to do here is teach my students cardiac physiology through an understanding of how we give drugs or pharmaceuticals to influence that physiology. Now, I've got a background in neuroscience, which means I have a background in electrophysiology. So, I'll, to the best of my knowledge, and I don't think it's necessarily a horribly uninformed knowledge, everything is, is correct based on my research. But again, I wouldn't use it as medical-based knowledge. When I look at cardiac drugs, I can break them down into three main types of drugs. I break them down into drugs that affect afterload, and we'll come back to that. Drugs that affect what's called chronotropy. And just like chronograph is a watch, chronotropy means it's going to affect speed or time. The other thing is ionotropy. And ionotropy means you're going to affect how ions enter the muscle cells of the heart and affect how hard it contracts. So let's go through that and say, what exactly are we talking about? After load, what we're talking about is resistance the heart pumps against. How much is the blood pushing back that the heart is trying to push out? And this obviously has relevance because if we can thin that or decrease afterload, that's going to, first thing it's going to do is it's going to increase com something called stroke volume. And I'm just going to shorten this as SV. And if you don't understand stroke volume, I'll be putting up another video later that describes cardiac output. So CO is cardiac output. The gist of it is stroke volume is how many milliliters of blood that can be pumped per cycle. And if you can increase that, then you can increase how much blood is pumped which is cardiac output. And essentially, cardiac output is a combination. It's the product, specifically, of how much blood you can pump per cycle versus how many cycles. So cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. Chronotropy is essentially heart rate. We're going to affect the cells in the atrium of the heart that set the pace. And ionotropic drugs will affect contractility. If we come back over here to afterload, there's really four different ways that we can decrease afterload. Again, decrease the resistance that the heart has to pump against. One of the things that might be a problem that's stressing the heart is we've got thick blood. And this is going to come up again, but what I mean by thick blood here is I mean platelets are aggregating. So you can give drugs that decrease platelet aggregation. They don't like to stick together with them. And this is the basis for giving things like aspirin. You can also decrease what's called coagulation, or I'm going to shorten it to just clotting. So if you've had some knowledge on blood, you know that there's two different steps. There's multiple steps, but the two basic steps are platelet. Basically, platelets plug the hole, and then they get tied down, is the way I describe it. They tie, get tied down in clotting. So two of those things, if blood is clotting, or if platelets are aggregating inside of the blood vessel, then that's going to be harder for the heart to push that sticky blood. Another thing that can happen that can increase afterload is what if there's too much fluid? If you think about drinking a, a liter of water, all of a sudden you've gone from 5 liters of blood to 6 liters of blood. That's harder on the heart to pump, so that's too much fluid. What you can do then is give somebody a diuretic, and a diuretic makes you go to the bathroom specifically makes you urinate. And there are multiples, if you've got some background on this, there's loop diuretics, there's thiazomide diuretics, um, there's a bunch of different diuretics, there's potassium sparing diuretics, but we're just going to basically focus on the real simple ones, which are to reduce sodium reuptake in kidneys.
if you don't take up sodium, then you don't take up water, and there's less food. I think about it in terms of if you eat a bunch of popcorn, then sodium, you're eating a bunch of sodium, and water follows it. So what I'm trying to say is sodium and water tend to stick together. So if you can reduce sodium uptake in the kidneys, then you're also reducing water uptake, which means you're going to get rid of fluid. Another thing you can do is what if vessels are too constricted? Vessels can dilate and vessels can constrict. And one of the ways to decrease afterload is to make your blood vessels larger, and that's going to decrease the resistance of blood flowing through it. So if we can dilate vessels, then we can reduce this constriction and make it easier for blood to flow through these vessels. It's just like uh, if you want to move a lot of water, you'd like a nice big wide open hose, a big diameter hose versus a small one. Same thing here is if we'd like to move a lot of blood, make it easier for the heart to increase cardiac output, then we could dilate the vessels. And the classic one to do this is inhibit something called ACE. And we will talk about ACE when we get to the urinary system because ACE is in a cascade where renin is released by the kidneys. It leads to ACE, which is put out by the capillaries and allows blood vessels to constrict, and it also causes sodium to be reabsorbed. So ACE is also going to inhibit this. What's going to happen is this is going to cause blood vessels to dilate. So ACE inhibitors, normally ACE is put out by capillaries, and they give renin kind of permission to constrict blood vessels, because renin likes to increase blood, blood pressure. Well, if we inhibit ACE, we inhibit renin, and then renin cannot lead to a state where we dilate blood vessels, and renin also causes sodium uptake, so it's kind of a complex mo molecule. So if we inhibit both of those, we end up inhibiting sodium reabsorption, and we cause blood vessels to dilate. Another way that we can affect blood pressure is if there's too much lipid in vessels or blood. If there's too much lipid in the blood vessel, then that means uh, you're going to narrow the blood vessel and wouldn't it be nice to get rid of that extra lipid. Or if you've got too much lipid in the blood, it makes it really thick and viscous. So it would be nice to get rid of that. So what you can do is give anti hyper lipidemics. These reduce lipids in the blood. An example are statins. Okay, so that finishes up drugs that affect afterload. And we'll come back to afterload in another video, but just wanted to reiterate one more time that basically these drugs make it easier for the heart to pump blood by making the